Hello everyone, welcome and greetings once again. We're working our way through the book of Nehemiah. We're spending time in God's Word and I hope that this is something that is beneficial and um, I know it's been beneficial for me. The study has been amazing. I've, I've, I've taught through Nehemiah a number of times over the years and this time it has been so uh, rewarding to uh, go through this book. So um, let's pray together for a few moments and ask God to bless our time. And then I trust that we will be able to dig into Nehemiah 6 and 7 and see the various impact of what this is saying, how it affects our lives today, even though this took place uh, 2,500 years ago. So um, let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your goodness and grace. I praise you for the word, for the scriptures. They are inspired. They are, they are superintended as they were written by the Holy Spirit, and he helped those authors to be able to record the truths that are necessary for us to understand. There's nothing in the Bible that is irrelevant. There are things that are more difficult to understand than others. And as we see the story of Nehemiah, Father, we realize that this is one that uh, hits home because there's so much there that very much could be in the front pages of our newspapers today or our headlines of, of the newscast today. So, Father, help us to see how this relates to our lives and what you're wanting to teach us. Use what I say to reveal the things that need to be expressed and exposed. And I entrust these moments to you, Father. I pray that you'll guard my mind and my mouth as I express what is being said here, as I think through and then express it. I pray that you'll help that I can communicate things in such a way that we will be thankful that we heard or, or understood this once we're done with this study. I do pray your blessing over those that are watching and listening, that you would help them to be able to grasp the truths so they can see how it applies to life on a very consistent basis, the things that are practical, the things that are personal. And I just ask you for that, Father. Again, I pray that you'll help me as I try to express and communicate. And I ask your blessing over this time for the sake of your glory and your honor, Father. That's the key. We want to be honoring and glorifying to you. And I pray that we'll see that through the study today from Nehemiah. So use it for your glory, Father, and help us, please. I pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. All right. Well, you know... I like to ride my bike. I, I love bike riding in the weather recently. Oh, there have been some stormy days and some rain too, but uh, by and large, there's been good bi bicycle weather recently, even though it's been somewhat windy. But you know, when it's windy, it's very hard to coast. You've got to keep pedaling because the wind is pushing. And I, I wonder, how, how often do we want to just ride and ride and then stop pedaling and just coast for a ways? I remember as a child, I used to love to do that, especially in certain areas where I'd go up a hill and down the hill I'd coast. And that was good. But you know, it's important for us to realize as we take the analogy here or look at the connection, the relationship between bike riding and the Christian life, the Christian life is not something where we're supposed to coast. God doesn't intend for us to be coasting. In fact, I, a quote that I found uh, as is, is, is I begin this message um, it expresses here that Carl Jaspers, he was a German uh, psychologist and one that he, he, his quotes are in several Christian books. Warren Wiersbe quoted him, others do too. But he says, the power of leadership appears to be declining everywhere. More and more people we see coming into the top levels of management, of leadership, they're merely drifting. They're coasting. And I think that it's important that we realize that, that in the Christian life, God doesn't want us to coast. Uh, when I was in the Army, I had the privilege, the opportunity. I got to know a, ch a chopper pilot, and he invited me and another friend of mine one time to go on a training flight that he was doing when he was going from Fort Knox to St. Louis and then back. It was a long flight for a helicopter, for a Huey. And one of the things they did, after they got in with all the training exercises, 
we were wearing our helmets in the, in the back seats of the of the helicopter, and the two pilots were up front, and and uh, you know we could hear what they were saying, we could hear their their talk to the uh, the towers and all that as we as we flew, and at one point they they clicked on the intercom and said to us, hey, we're going to do something different here. This is a training exercise. Yes, we're going to shut off the engines. And they did. And I'm watching the, the altimeter. And we were at a, I forget what the exact height was. We were up just below the level where we needed oxygen. And we started there. And as we're watching the altimeter, it was lower, 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 because a helicopter, it doesn't coast. Oh, they say that they won't necessarily crash hard if, if, if there's, you know, the, the appropriate landing mechanisms in place. But yet the engines were off and I say, hey, we're getting low. And I flip my intercom on. And I say, hey, guys, when are we going to turn this thing back on? And they started laughing. He said, we were going to do it soon, but we were waiting until when you guys got scared. The reality is a helicopter doesn't coast. It drops. And, you know, in this training exercise, that was part of their exercise. And, you know, we realized, oh, no, this, you know, we don't want to crash. But the Christian life, too, we're like helicopters. We don't coast. We need to keep moving forward. And that's important. And that's what Nehemiah teaches us in this passage we're looking at today. Now, we're looking at chapter 6, verse 14, into chapter 7. And I'm going to read this right now. Listen as I read and, and get these verses here. It says here that Nehemiah is praying, and he's praying over the uh, fact that they'd had a lot of opposition, they'd had a lot of challenges, and challenges from these guys, Tobiah, Sanballat, and Geshem. And he says, Remember, O oh my God, Tobiah and Sanballat according to their works, and also Noadiah, the prophetess, and the rest of the prophets who were trying to frighten us. We read on and it says, So now the wall was completed on the 25th of the month Elul in 52 days. Amazing project. When all our enemies heard it and all the nations surrounding us saw it, they lost confidence for they recognized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Amen, right? Amen. God had helped them. Also in those days, many letters went from the nobles of Judah to Tobiah, one of the enemies, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara, the son of Jehoianan, and had married the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. Moreover, they were speaking about his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. In other words, they were telling Tobiah everything that Nehemiah had said. It says, when Tobiah then sent letters to frighten me. And that's Tobiah. And remember, he just prayed to God, remember Tobiah according to his deeds. And Nehemiah is saying, hey, they shouldn't be forgiven for what they've done. And Tobiah was a Jewish man. He was connected to the Jewish people. Now, we're going to explain that a little bit more as we get into the message. But now we read the first few verses of chapter 7. The rest of chapter 7 is all kinds of names, and it's a census. But the beginning of the chapter says, Now when the wall was rebuilt, and I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers, and the singers and the Levites were appointed, in other words, worship could be started. That's in the message we're going to do in a couple weeks. But he says, Then I put Hanani, my brother, and Hananiah, the commander of the fortress, in charge of Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. He was reverent. He feared God. He had great faith. And as then I said to them, Do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot, and while they are standing guard, and let them then shut and bolt the doors. Also appoint the guards from the inhabitants of Jerusalem, each at his post, and each one in front of his own house. Now the city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few, and the houses were not built. For God had put into my heart to assemble or to organize the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogies. Then I found the book of the genealogy of those who came up first, in which I found the following record, and then there's the census. And we read those words, and we see Nehemiah saying, okay, the wall is done. It's completed. 52 days, an amazing, amazing project, an amazing blessing from God. And as we see that, 
What I want to do is I want to use five statements that we pull from Nehemiah from the chapters that we've read here that we've studied already, five statements from Nehemiah, and draw a couple of very important applications or conclusions. And then we're going to look at four different aspects of what we learned from Nehemiah. Nehemiah teaches us, you know, what made him to be an extraordinary example of leadership, an extraordinary example of one that was faithful, an extraordinary example of one that, that loved God and wanted to bring glory to him. What made Nehemiah that extraordinary example? We first, we, we see he provided an extraordinary example as an ordinary person who stood out and stood up as a godly leader who stood against evil, evil that was holding back the Jewish people from bringing glory to God. Now, the five statements from Nehemiah that could help introduce our study today. Number one, from chapter one, verse 11, Nehemiah is praying. He's just found out about Jerusalem. And he's praying, he's spending time fasting and praying before God. And he's, oh Lord, I appeal to you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, and get this next statement, and the prayer of your servants, plural, who delight to give glory to your name. Nehemiah says, hey, there are people here that delight to give glory to your name, and please hear our prayers. And the issue is Nehemiah was one he delighted to give glory to God's name. That's an important reality. Now, secondly, chapter 2, verse 12. He's in Jerusalem. He's surveying what was going on. He's seeing what the work that needed, what was the work that needed to be done. And he says, So I came to Jerusalem and I was there for three days. He rested. And then he says, And I arose in the night, and I and a few men were with me. And he says this very next statement, I did not tell anyone what my God was putting into my mind to do for Jerusalem. Nehemiah was saying, God was speaking to him. God was leading him. He was seeking to follow what God wanted. Thirdly, third statement, he's praying here again regarding Sanballat and Tobiah. I mentioned that a little bit ago from what I read in chapter 6. But this is from chapter... Uh, Actually, again, this is chapter 6, and, and, he, and he says, um, Remember, O oh my God, Tobiah and Sanballat according to their works, according to the things they've done, and also Noadiah the prophetess, and the rest of the prophets who are trying to frighten me. Nehemiah is praying that, hey, stop these people and help us to respond properly to their evil deeds. And he's asking that. Now, the fourth statement so the wall was completed, chapter 6, verse 15, in 52 days. Wow! When all our enemies heard it, and all the nations surrounding us saw it, they lost their confidence. For they recognized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. They realized this wasn't some human effort. They recognized this wasn't something that you know, mankind put together for themselves. This was something God did through the Israelites. And the enemies, they were disheartened. They were discouraged. But you know what? That doesn't mean that they stopped their opposition. But now the final statement from chapter 7, verse 5, I read that just a little while ago. It says, Then my God put into my heart to organize the nobles, the officials, and the people to be enrolled by genealogies. Nehemiah says, I was listening to God. I found what he wanted, and I was going to fulfill that. And I want to give three verses from the New Testament that are practical applications of these five statements, and then we're going to dig into what was it that made Nehemiah unique? What was it that made him extraordinary? What was it that made him an example for us to follow? Now, these three applications, number one, Matthew 5.16 Jesus speaks and says, Let your light shine before people in such a way that they will see your good works. Let your light shine before people that they'll see your good works. And that's not a matter of what you're doing. They're seeing that God's working through you. And he says, And when they see your good works, they will glorify your Father who's in heaven. Now notice, it's not, Hey, let your light shine before people so they'll glorify you, so they'll say, Hey, boy, you're really good. No, so that they'll glorify God. That's why we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we serve God the Father. That's why we try to fulfill the admonitions of Scripture. Not so much that 
will be the will get the attention, but rather that God will get the attention. God's glory is at stake always. But secondly, we read those five things from Nehemiah and we see something from Ephesians 6 verses 12 and 13 where it says our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Then Paul says, Therefore, take up the full armor of God, that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything, have I done everything I should? Can I stand firm because I've done what God wants me to do in getting prepared? That's a very important practical application. And as we look at that, we realize, okay, Nehemiah said, let, my, let, my, let your ear be attentive. Hear what I'm praying, God. God. He needed God to do the work. He needed God to help. He needed God to lead. And we need God to protect us. We need to take up the full armor of God. We need to have, do everything we can to stand firm against the evils of our society. And thirdly, John writes... This is something we don't read often because it's one of John's smaller letters. 2 John, verse 8, he says, Be on guard for yourselves, that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Be on guard. Be watchful. Be alert. Be awake. Don't let, don't let the enemy take away that which you've accomplished. So now... I've got four things and then some applications to close that give us an understanding of what made Nehemiah unique, what made him an extraordinary example, what made him somebody that we can say, hey, look at this man, and we should be able to say, okay, I want to be like him. Number one, Nehemiah's objective. His objective. He came to Jerusalem after Hanani, his, his brother, came to Susa and told him about the walls broken down, told him how the people were in distress, told him that things weren't safe there. And Nehemiah mourned over that and he prayed over that. He fasted for four months. And then God gave him the opportunity to speak to the king. And he said, I want to go to Jerusalem and I want to build, rebuild the walls. Now, Nehemiah probably knew that years before, other people had gone to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, and yet the enemies who were part of the Persian Empire, the enemies of the Jews, part of the Persian Empire, they contacted the king way back when and said, hey, we don't like the Jerusalems being rebuilt, and the king stopped the effort. And Nehemiah goes to the king this time and says, I want to rebuild the walls. And what was his objective? It wasn't merely a physical construction project. Yes, he was building walls. But he was going beyond a physical construction project. He was going there because God was going to be involved in this. And God was going to restore to the Jewish people a sense of glory. A glory to the, the fact that they were God's people. And this was not a physical construction project. Rather, it was a spiritual construction project. Where Nehemiah, yes, was going to build the walls. And the people were going to work together with him in doing that. But his goal was God's glory. He wanted to bring honor and glory to God, and he wanted the Jewish people to be able to bring glory to God in the way that they lived there in Jerusalem and in the surrounding region. Nehemiah understood that the world needs to see that God is at work in the lives of his people. He understood that the world needs to see that God is at work in our lives. And I think sometimes we are living our lives for ourselves. We're living in the moment rather than living in the spirit. And I realize we need sometimes, yes, to be in the moment. We need to be able to see what's going on and do the things that need to be done in a very personal way. Maybe situations that happen around our house or situations that happen in, in, in our work uh, re responsibilities. And we need to be in the moment. We need to be attent attentive and alert. But we need, to beyond, be, be, we need to be living beyond in the moment. And we need to understand that God wants the world to see that he's at work in our lives. And sometimes we shield that from the world. Sometimes we're stopping the impact we can have on a society because we're not allowing God to show in our lives. Now, the mission that Nehemiah had taken up was in a certain sense impossible. Now, it wasn't impossible because God was going to work in it, 
Just like John 15 says, apart from me, you can do nothing. It was a mission impossible, but that was without God's help. But with God's help, they were able to do something that was amazing. They built the wall, and I think we measured it. That was It was close to two and a half miles, two and a half miles around the city of Jerusalem. It was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 feet high, and the walls were broken down, and it was all concrete, rocks, and they built this without power equipment, and they did it in 52 days. And that success caught the eye of the enemy. It caught the eye of the enemy. Nehemiah's objective was that that success would catch the eye of the enemy. He wanted to do what Matthew 5.16 says, that the works that they were done for God's glory would catch the eye of those outside, and they'd say, wow, I want to glorify that God that did that. I want to honor that God. I want to know that God. I want see, to see that that God can be at work in my life too. And that success caught the eye of the enemy. Now, as it caught the eye of the enemy, we see, secondly, Nehemiah's opposition. How did Nehemiah handle the opposition? Well, he prayed first. He always prayed first. And I think sometimes we are too, too late to the prayer responsibilities. I think sometimes we don't spend nearly enough time praying before God the Father Almighty, seeking His honor, seeking His glory, seeking His will to be done in our lives. We want what we want, but do we want what God wants? Sometimes we, be, we become our own greatest enemy. Sometimes we become the opposition. But Nehemiah's opposition, they were embarrassed. They tried to stop the project. They tried to, to, to delay the project. They tried to distract from the project. They, at times, I think, thought, felt maybe they could go in and destroy the project. They worked hard to stop it, but they couldn't. And I think they were probably scratching their heads saying, how come we can't stop this? These people, we've been able to stop it in the past. We've been able to control the Jewish people. And this time they're saying, we can't stop. And Nehemiah dealt with the opposition in such a way that he was going to show them that God was at work in their lives, in, 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 in the lives of the Jewish people. These opponents were discouraged, but they were still determined. They were wanting to destroy Israel. They did not want to give in to the Israelites. Why? Because they knew God was at work, and they were opponents of God. It wasn't flesh and blood that they were fighting. Rather, it was spiritual. It was a spiritual battle. But we should never forget that God is at work to teach us to depend on Him in the midst of our spiritual battles. When we face opposition, we face the enemy. We face the struggles that this world brings our way because of sinfulness, because of so many different viewpoints and values that are so contrary to God's Word. We face challenges. We face changes of laws. I recognize that there are counseling laws there are laws regarding the counseling that I do that certain things I need to be careful how I deal with those things. Now, I'm going to continue to use God's Word, and I'm going to continue to stand strong in the truth. I'm not going to bend to the compromise, but I'm going to recognize that sometimes there are changes and challenges that I need to know about. But as we see this, Nehemiah's opposition, he understood the enemy. He was wise and he was discerning in how he dealt with the enemy. He prayed first. And what we see is, is that, you know, if God's people, in fact, let me find this quote that I'm, I'm, I'm using right now. Uh, I don't have it in my notes. I thought I did. I just I think the way it goes that if God's people don't protect what God has accomplished in our lives, the enemy is going to swoop in and try to destroy it. The enemy is going to try to swoop in and destroy what we do. The opposition is always at work. We need to realize the opposition doesn't stop. Now, when the millennium comes, when Christ returns, his, his second coming, this is after the rapture, after the tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, the second coming of Christ... 
will come with him because we will be in glory coming down from heaven with Jesus Christ. And he's going to set up his kingdom. And at that point in time, the adversary, Satan, is going to be locked up. The enemy is going to be stopped to some degree during that time frame. But we need to understand in this day and age, the enemy's at work. The opposition is there trying to stop us. But now as we look through the O's here, first, Nehemiah's objective, always bring glory to God. Secondly, Nehemiah's opposition, realize that they're going to be there. They're going to challenge. They're going to try to disrupt and and, and destroy. They're going to try to deceive and distract. But now the next thing, the fourth thing in in, in the notes here, Nehemiah's obedience and what we see in his first prayer that we, we, we read about here earlier, the first statement, O Lord, I appeal to you that your ear will be attentive to the prayer of your servant, that meaning Nehemiah, but also the prayer of your servants. And Nehemiah could be talking about anybody that was, he, he, granted, he prayed that 2,500 years ago. But if we look at what that says, that is basically describing the fact that, wait a minute now, Nehemiah is saying, the prayers of your servants who delight to bring glory to your name. That's me and that's you. And and Nehemiah's obedience, he realized that we should delight in bringing glory to God's name. We should be excited about obeying him. Now, obeying him is going to be a challenge sometimes. We're going to get opposition. We're going to get pushback. We're going to get persecution. But we should pursue whatever God puts into our hearts and minds. We should see the different admonitions in Scripture. We should see the things that God's Word teaches us, the one and others throughout Paul's writings, in John's writings, in Peter's writings. We should see the one and others and say, okay, God says this is an exhortation. This is an admonition. This is an instruction that we have. And we should delight in obeying God. Our obedience does not earn our salvation. In fact, our salvation is simply because Jesus Christ obeyed and died on the cross of Calvary in our place. He paid the penalty for each of us. We place our trust, we place our belief in Jesus Christ, our dependence on what he accomplished for us. With God's provision, we are saved. We trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But now that we've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are asked by God to live a testimony for him. To live in such a way that our obedience, our obedience stands out as we stand against the evil of our society. Why? Because we don't speak the way others speak. We don't act the way others act. We don't have the different values and viewpoints that the rest of the world has because we have a biblical worldview. We have a biblical understanding of what we're supposed to be doing and how we're supposed to be doing it. And Nehemiah's obedience was very amazing because he stood against the challenges of Tobiah, of Sanballat, of all the other enemies. He stood against the challenges that the Israelite people brought to him when they charged exorbitant interest toward one another when they took advantage of one another. Nehemiah obeyed God's guidelines, and he stood strong, he stood firm. He stood as an example, an extraordinary example for us to follow. But now the last thing we're going to see before the applications is Nehemiah's organization. Notice it says, chapter 7, verse 5, he says, Now God had put into my heart to organize the nobles, the officials, and the people to be enrolled by genealogies. He saw that Jerusalem, there weren't a lot of people living in the city. It wasn't well populated. And they built the walls. There were still some homes that obviously needed to be built because it says the the homes were broken down as we see in, in the text. But yet, Nehemiah's organization says, I need to organize the people. We built the walls. He organized them in order to build the walls. They did it in 52 days, an amazing accomplishment. Only God could do that through them. But Nehemiah had a sense of strategy and a sense of strength in the Lord that said, we're going to get organized here in the city. He set up guards. In fact, first what he did, chapter 7, it says, the walls were rebuilt, the doors were set up, 
the gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites were appointed. The singers were appointed. Worship was going to begin. They were going to spend time in worship. And we're going to see that here in a couple of weeks when I come back to this, this, this study. Actually, next week, Pastor Andy's going to speak. He's going to speak from chapter 8 about the importance of God's Word. But that's, that's for next week. And then the following week, I'm going to go back to chapter 7 and in chapter 8 and talk about worship. Talk about giving. But as we look at this, Nehemiah appointed trustworthy people as gatekeepers. He appointed Hananiah, his brother. He knew his brother was faithful. He appointed Hananiah, another individual, a commander of the fortress, and he put him in charge of Jerusalem. He's make sure that the gates are closed at night. Make sure that the, the guards are, are doing their jobs. And he appointed trustworthy people to help him lead. And he delegated those that were dependable. And as we think about that, he, he, he chose those that were capable, that had the qualifications, that had the sense of trustworthiness. The people that, as it says here about Hananiah, it says right here, it says Hananiah, he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. People that had a great respect and reverence for God. That was the qualification. And as we appoint or nominate leaders in our church, as we appoint those that are going to be teaching, those that are being doing different responsibilities, we need to choose those that are faithful. We need to choose those that fear God, that have reverence and respect for God. You need to choose people that fear God more than they fear people. When people fear people, when people fear what people are going to say, when they look at people's opinions, when they look at all the different things, the chatter, the gossip, the garbage that people spread, when people look at that and say, oh, I'm afraid, I'm troubled by that, they need to stop women now. Do I fear God or do I fear people? When people are big and God is small, we have a problem. Ed Welch wrote a great book by that title. But we need to understand that there's a sense of delegation that is done through a filter of dependability. And Nehemiah appointed people in the proper way, in the proper perspective. He realized this one's going to do a good job because he's been tested. He's been proven. And we need to see that for ourselves. So, we draw some conclusions. We see, this is why Nehemiah was an extraordinary example, but what do we learn from this? Well, number one, never forget. Never forget, prayer is always our first priority. We need to pray and pray and pray again. The first thing we should do when we face a challenge is pray. The first thing we need to do when we see something coming our way that says, okay, how am I going to handle this? Pray for wisdom. We need to pray and look at God's Word. And therefore, never forget prayer is always our first priority. But secondly, if and when we lose sight of our objective, Nehemiah's objective, give honor and glory to God. And he sought, he feared God more than anything else. He respected and reverenced God more than anything else. And he saw that God was at work in what was needing to be done. And therefore, Nehemiah, he understood that, hey, maintain the objective. Focus on the objective. Honor and glorify God. And we need to be clear and defined in our objectives. And when we lose sight of our objective, that is do all for the glory of God, we begin to coast. We begin to drift. We begin to sink like that helicopter was sinking. And that's when we'll become more vulnerable to disobedience. We'll become more vulnerable to doubt. We'll become more vulnerable to discouragement. And then we're going to be more easy to be defeated because we've lost sight of our objective. God gets the honor and glory. But now thirdly, after spiritual victories, you know what? Okay, we're riding our bikes. We're going up a hill. We get to the top of the hill, and we want to coast. We want to coast because, ah, I'm tired. And coasting's good for a short time. But you know what? After spiritual victories, we must remain steadfast and stable. Steadfast and sure. 
We need to make sure that we're, 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 we're still strong in, in the Lord's strength, working to do what God wants us to do. Understand, after spiritual victories, the enemy may see, okay, God worked in that, but they're going to watch us and see how are they responding. Are they proud? Are they pumping up their own chest and saying, hey, look what I did? Or do they say, no, look what God has done, and look at how we're going to continue to serve him. The enemy is still watching for ways to distract and defeat us, even though we've had a spiritual victory. So let's be careful. I remember the old mountaintop experience of getting to a retreat, to a Promise Keepers event, to camp as a child. I'd come home from camp all fired up and, whoa, whoa, this is fab fabulous, this is great. And so many times, you know, a week later, we're deflated, sometimes defeated. Why? Because we've not remained steadfast and stable. After spiritual victories, we don't, we don't let, let down our guard. And Nehemiah set up guards after the spiritual victory of the walls were completed. Now, fourthly, let's realize godly leadership is essential. Godly leadership is, in fact, absolutely essential. Former executive director of YFC, Ted Engstrom, he said, in our contemporary culture, we see the tragedy of weak people in important places. Now, he said this years ago. I look at weak people in important places today, and in, in, in government places, sometimes in church leadership, I see weak people in important places. Little people in big jobs. People who do not have the spiritual qualifications. People who don't have the spiritual know-how, the spiritual strength. They don't have God working with them or in them. And that's a challenge. And Engstrom says, this leads to cultural chaos and confusion, and it reduces the effectiveness of church ministry. And we shouldn't just ignore or say, okay, we're just going to put people in leadership positions. This empty, empty position, let's just fill it with somebody, anybody, just a warm body. That's a challenge, and that can't happen. Because when we just do that that way, it leads to cultural chaos and confusion, and it reduces the effectiveness of the ministries in the church. We need spiritually qualified strong leaders. And that's important. And what goes into that? We need to be training each other. We need to be discipling each other. We need to be teaching each other and holding each other accountable. All that is part of the process. But now before we get too focused on, okay, that's a challenge, and how are we going to do that? Let's realize, last point, Last application, God will always accomplish his will and keep his work going when we depend on him by doing his work his way and following his guidelines. God will always fill in the gaps. God will always accomplish his will and keep his work going when we are seeking to follow his way of doing what he wants. So therefore, when we just, we can throw up our arms and say, hey, that's too hard, that's too difficult. No, we see what God's word says. We follow what God's word teaches. We obey the one another's. We obey the instructions, the exhortations, the admonitions. We allow the Holy Spirit to control our lives and to lead us. And when we do that, we can be assured God is going to be at work. Because you know what? Nehemiah realized that the goal in Jerusalem was for the enemies to see that God was at work in the lives of the people. God was at work in the lives of the people. And are we today in our church seeking to make sure that the people around us, those that don't know Christ, those that may not, they may not be enemies, they might be in places, but those people that surround us and watch us, do they see that God is at work in our lives and that God is filling us up and then he's giving us the strength to do what we do? Because we don't do it on our own. We do it with his help. Let's pray. God Almighty, I thank you for the truth of this passage.
Thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for the truths that you give to us whenever we open up the scriptures. May they jump off the page, but may they jump into our hearts, into our minds, into our lives. May we be literally impacted and influenced constantly by the work of your spirit and also the work of your word as we hide it in our hearts that we won't sin. As we see that it is a light to the path, that it is a lamp to the way that we need to be going. I just pray, Father, your guidance, your help. I thank you for Jesus Christ. I pray if anyone's watching, anyone's listening, who has never fully understood that we're all sinners, we all fall short of your great standard, but Father, you gave to us the gift of forgiveness through Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. He paid a price for our sins that we might trust in him and be forgiven. I pray if anybody needs that truth today, that they might grab hold of that, and then they might trust Jesus. And again, I thank you for what you're doing today and, and, and throughout the, the, the days ahead. I pray your blessing over this church. I pray your blessing over each person that watches these videos. I pray your strength over the church at large, Father. And I just praise you and love you, and I thank you. And I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, hey. It's exciting to be able to teach God's Word. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear what you think, what your, what your thoughts might be as far as how God's Word's working in your life. And I thank you for tuning in. So, uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. And uh, Lord bless.